Hello. Welcome to Research Evaluation and Evidence Generation in Population Health. This is Lecture A. The objectives in this lecture are to prepare research goals, apply the correct research design to goals, and describe program evaluation strategies. Data is important at every touchpoint in a learning healthcare system. Knowledge is power. We need to learn how to glean data at every step to inform decisions made at every level. There's an iterative process to identify projects that are worthwhile. You'll see here that you often start at the community level. We're moving from right to left in some ways. That's the data flow. We can start to think about population and healthcare. Then we think about health systems and how we can generate evidence about those. Once we generate that evidence, we want to feed that evidence. And you'll see this in this diagram. Back to the health systems and population. This is similar to the precede, proceed model. What are some hints for writing good, quality goals when you start to engage the public on your work group? Goals should be presented in an integrated format with outcomes and accomplishments, not the process, and should be put into a single sentence. Goals should also capture broad changes in conditions. Goals may reflect behavior, attitude, or economic change, showing contributions toward a larger development impact. Lastly, goals will usually look for results achieved over a time period. One of the nice things about writing good goals in a single sentence is that you can almost format it, like in this example we're showing here. Some of you may remember as kids having Mad Libs, where you just fill in the necessary nouns, verbs, or adjectives to end up reading a funny little story. Writing your goals is a similar exercise, just a little more serious and organized. For this example, we are thinking of the how, the what, behavior, practice, attitude, etc., and the whom. So for this example, the blanks could be filled in to make the goal. I want to improve the diets of children among our schools here in Greater Baltimore. This is a very specific quality goal. You can see that there are many different ways we can go about this. Here are some examples of what not to do as well as what to do. One example, quote, to improve health, end quote, is far too general a statement. We don't know what population it applies to or how we're going to go about it. The next example, quote, to improve the health practices of people living in targeted pastoral communities, end quote, might be something a church group would do. You might actually want to make it even more specific and talk about specific health practices, such as exercise or diet. Another example, quote, to reduce conflict, end quote, is too broad. To narrow it down, you might want to talk about conflicts in a particular region of the world. After you have written your broadly stated goals, you'll need to start building objectives. Objectives are statements of desired, specific, realistic, and measurable program results. Objectives should follow what we call the SMART approach. S stands for specific. That means identifying very specific actions we want to take. M is measurable. To simply say, quote, improve people's diets, end quote, for example, may not be measurable. We may want to reduce the amount of sugar they consume, increase the amount of vegetables and fruits they consume, or reduce their overall caloric intake. These objectives are measurable. Appropriate. If I wanted to affect diet and then talk about the foods people ate, that would be logically related. For example, when we talk about dietary changes, we'll often talk about energy gain, which has two components. What did you consume? And how much did you exercise? Think about the appropriateness. Realistic. Can I really expect to change the amount or behavior in question? Dietary changes can be very difficult. People are very set in their ways. Oftentimes, the community doesn't have the necessary infrastructure to support change. So you need to make sure that your goals are realistic and that you have the resources to achieve them. 
time-based. The best gold all have time windows. As a matter of fact, in larger projects, you may have several milestones where you want to measure the effectiveness of your program. We're going to try to make this a little bit simpler for you and actually give you some templates that you can start with so that you're not facing a blank sheet. A properly stated objective is action-oriented, starts with the word to, and is followed by an action verb. Objectives address questions of what, who, how much, and when, but not why or how. Quality objectives should be tied very closely to your goals. While the goals are the big picture, the objectives are far more granular. The objectives are actually helping you plan your program intervention. Make your objectives even more refined, for example. I want to reduce the amount of sugar eaten by children in our elementary schools by at least 50% as measured by a six-month time frame. Here you can see some objectives that people have used in other programs. The next part of our lecture deals with applying the correct research design to measure goal achievement. This requires us to consider a few questions. For example, what is research? We often think about the scientist in the lab. You may see a picture in your mind of beakers and Bunsen burners, tubes, and wires. But research is really far more broad than that. It is a systematic means of problem solving. There are five key characteristics to research. First, it is systematic. In other words, there's a clearly defined process. This is often referred to as the philosophy of science. Second, research is logical. We often follow two types of schema. One is called induction, where we see a phenomenon and then build a theory around it. The classic example of this is Newton with the apple. The apple fell on Newton's head. He started to try to figure out why this mattered, and he thought of something called gravity. The other means of logic is what we call deduction. This is having a theory about what has occurred and then trying to prove that theory. Recently on the news, some researchers discovered gravitational waves. This is pretty high-end physics, but none other than Albert Einstein had a theory of how the world and the universe worked. He predicted these gravitational waves through a process of deduction. Empirical. Not all research is empirical, but many of those activities that are related to population health programs are empirical. This is where we're actually going out and measuring, engaged in evidence-based approaches to science. Reductive. This means that we can take the results from our program, apply them in another similar community or setting, and get the same type of results. In other words, they'll be generalizable results that can be used by other audiences. Similarly, we should be able to prove that our method worked. In other words, it's replicable. This has been in the news for scientists a great deal over the past few years as they have struggled to reproduce some scientific studies that have been very influential, particularly in psychology, which has great relevance for those of us in population health. What is the research process? Once we know our goals and objectives, we often start with a literature review. Have other people studied our questions? If so, we may simply want to replicate their work and their best practices. That's a perfectly reasonable approach to population health interventions. On the other hand, we may find that there's a gap in what's out there, and we need to formulate questions based on that literature. At that point, we'll want to select an appropriate design. There may have been prior literature that did very similar work, and we may want to replicate that research design. In most population health studies, data will be collected, and we want to make sure that we're collecting relevant data. It's very tempting to, quote, boil the ocean, end quote, as the saying goes, and put together lots of data collection that may or may not be relevant to the questions at hand. Once we've collected our data, we want to be able to interpret the findings. This is often where you need people who have PhDs or higher level degrees in statistics and epidemiology to help you interpret your findings. 
You probably want to have those people on board prior to your data collection to ensure that you can do the interpretation in the most parsimonious or simplest way. Lastly, it's important to publish your findings. If you're funded through grant money or some external source, you'll have to publish your findings to that audience to ensure that their money has been well spent. We often talk about cost-effectiveness research. However, you may also wish to publish your findings into the general literature so that other people can pick up and use your program or intervention. Research design has a continuum. We have analytical research, descriptive research, and experimental research. Let's talk a little bit more about each of those. Analytic research often uses reviews or meta-analysis. A meta-analysis is when you look at all the studies that have gone before and try to combine their findings in some sort of systematic way. Analytical research is often done with reviews. This is where you really do need to go in and become, quote, one with the literature, end quote, as we used to say. Being able to conduct a good literature review almost to the point of meta-analysis is a worthwhile skill to have. You can also have a philosophical or theory-based approach. You can look at the different theories that are employed. You may want to find the model that you think is most applicable to your goals and objectives. For example, health belief model or precede, proceed. Philosophical research is organizing existing evidence into a single model. Analytical research often takes on a historical component. You may have to back into public records or interview witnesses to see how things were performed in the past. Descriptive research and case studies examine a single instance. When we say, quote, individual, end quote, we don't necessarily mean an individual person. It may be an individual site or community or intervention that you're examining. You won't necessarily have enough data around it to make statistical inferences. In some cases, your research design may be a single case study where you want to go study the intervention in a particular setting as something of a proof of concept. The case study may later lead to experimental research. Other descriptive research designs rely on surveys, which are very common in population health interventions. Surveys can take on a variety of forms. A cross-sectional survey is when you only take the survey at one time period. This is why they call it cross-sectional. You're cutting across time. A longitudinal study is where you may survey participants on more than one occasion. You may want to survey them before the intervention, during the intervention, and after you've ceased the program to see if the benefits continue. In this case, you might have several surveys going. Correlation is where you simply look at the relationship among variables, often using something called linear regression. Correlational research is using other people's data to test your model prior to actually going out in the field and spending the money. Correlational evidence is important to understand because we're often trying to demonstrate causality. By causality, we want to see that when a certain outcome increases Y, the X also increases. For example, if we increase the amount of exercise that our students are getting, X, we would hope to see that Y, their cardiovascular health, also increases. We'd like to prove that X increases Y. Confounding is where some other feature may actually be influencing the outcome of interest. For example, we may have an intervention where we're trying to improve our student's body mass index, BMI. In this case, decrease the index. We may change their diet and implement an exercise plan, but it's not clear which one is having the greater effect. Therefore, you need to be very careful because correlations do not necessarily infer causality. Experimental research is generally considered to be among the most involved and most rigorous approaches, where we vary a particular component of the environment or the intervention. We try to establish that by varying that input, we were able to change the outcomes.
that gives us some ability to suggest causality. You can use quasi-experimental designs, true research designs where you have case control, people blinded and randomly assigned, and statistical studies where often you're using secondary data. One thing that's important to do is have some definitions of these variables. The outcome of a particular program is often called the dependent variable. The program itself, or the variables that we move around, such as increasing the availability of bike lanes, improving people's diet, increasing their exercise, those would be the independent variables that are related to cause. I would like to now focus on evaluating your program and ensuring patient safety. Monitoring and evaluation are essential to any good program. You want to have milestones and metrics to ensure that you're carrying out the planned activities. Your funding agencies or community may require you to report at intermittent points what you're doing. You'll also want to see if you're having the desired outcomes in all the aspects that you promised. The goal is that you can make informed decisions on an ongoing basis and, if need be, make corrections. Monitoring is the routine tracking of activities, including things such as, are we doing what we said we would do in the particular time frames? How much are things costing? Who are we serving? The evaluation will look at this very explicitly. How well is the project being implemented? Your program will be formatively assessed. Are the desired changes being seen in the community? To what extent? This is where we're getting the intervention and outcome relationship and trying to demonstrate causality. Why implement monitoring and evaluation, M&E, in population health programs? We want to make informed, evidence-based decisions. You may need to make mid-course adjustments and refine the project's activities. You may need to go seek additional funding because things cost more than you anticipate. You want to explain the unique population changes that are occurring to other partners. You'll need to create records if you hope to make an evidence-based contribution or be able to replicate your study in the future. This is often referred to as institutional memory. You'll also want to be able to demonstrate the advantages of working across sectors. Population health programs tend to be multi-stakeholder engaged. When planning for your monitoring and evaluation, you want a very specific plan. It should be written out in advance of the program being started. It should be part of your funding application to some extent. It should explore how you're going to link and gather information and how you're going to measure your achievements. It'll document the consensus. If you have organizational meetings with multiple stakeholders, you'll want to document and post those publicly. You'll want to have standardization of many of your activities so that if you're putting in a population health program in multiple settings, then that program is being implemented in a similar fashion across all those settings. This is to measure your success. Monitoring and evaluation plans can occur across multiple levels. For many of us, they will occur at the community level, whether that's a neighborhood, a school, a city, a region of a state, a state, those sorts of things. And we even have national policies, of course. Your project should include a monitoring and evaluation plan prior to its beginning in earnest. In addition to identifying existing data sources and creating the necessary tools, you may want to anticipate and monitor some potential problems. The other big part of the M&E plan will be assigning specific responsibilities for monitoring. As you write these plans, you should think about their utility and the feasibility. For example, is the plan diplomatic or economical? Think about what your organization can do and how to share cost with your partners. Propriety. Are we acting legally and ethically with regard to those involved? And the accuracy. Are we able to actually describe what's happening in our program in a high-fidelity way? Let's summarize Lecture A.
Population health interventions are typically community-based, and they require engagement from the outset. In addition, they require plans to be laid out in advance for monitoring and evaluation. An effective research design should begin earlier. If you think you need a research designer, you do. If you're asking the question, go get somebody and get them on board early, because in part, you'll need a budget for these people as well. Ongoing monitoring and evaluation are also the norms.